challenges do you face in delineating change control requirements? How do you provide that level of oversight? What confidence do you have that your suppliers are accurately or adequately reporting those changes? Um, and what have you learned after the fact that one of your suppliers through a site audit or whatever has made a change, never notified you, and is in conflict with your own requirements? What steps did you take? So I welcome the panelists to respond to that, and certainly anybody from the floor. So delineation of change was the first part of your question. Some of the biggest challenges that we have, I'm just going to stand up so you can see me in the corners. <laughs> so the biggest challenge that we have is um, the, the petty changes, if you will. So a supplier wants to lay out a manufacturing floor differently and they want to move a piece of equipment. Is that a reportable change? And I think it depends on the industry that you're in, but I can tell you that, um, and again, I look to my peer across the room here, this is an area that we continue to get challenges on because suppliers don't understand, many of them don't understand, that we do have to go through that regulatory re reporting process. So. The, the changes come in when you get down to the lowest levels. Those are the ones that are the hardest to get our suppliers to report because, honestly, they don't understand what value it brings to communicating that to us. Um, I will explain or share with you an example where we had a supplier that thought they were doing a like-for-like -like change on a piece of equipment for sealing and ended up that that was not the case. And we ended up with um, not being, they actually notified us of the request for change, but when we dug into it later, found out that that was not all of the detail that we needed, so that bit us. Um, I will say that when we have situations where suppliers don't notify us of change, we consider that to be a medium risk in our regulatory compliance perspective and therefore we immediately open a CAPA uh, versus a SCAR, or you'll hear me talk tomorrow on CAPA versus SCAR. So um, we actually elevate that to the highest level in the organization because of the lack of notification of change and the significant impact downstream. So we take it pretty seriously, trying to continue to be very consistent in our approach that we want people to report things to us, we put it in our agreements, there's consequences when you don't. Great. Yeah, <clears throat> jump in for um, a little bit of the uh, the blame is, is on us, the manufacturers. We don't do a very good job in my estimation of actually being specific about what changes we're interested in knowing about. So we fill our quality agreements with all the illities, right? Reliability, serviceability. <laughs> if, any, if anything that you do affects any of those things, you have to tell us. And so over the last three years, we've been implementing a new uh, quality agreement, and that is 100% of the time we push back from the suppliers. You gotta be more specific. Tell me what you really are serious about. And frankly, we struggle doing that. So that's the area, that's on our side. On the uh, supplier side, I'll tell you a, a funny story. It's a little bit out of school. We do business, I'm with GE Healthcare. Uh, we, we're doing business with our own, one of our own divisions. Uh, outside of healthcare, and we gave them our new quality agreement. Said you got to report changes to us for the stuff you're giving us, and they said can't do it. I said excuse me, you want to go tell mom, right? <laughs> you, you have to do it as part of the regulation. They said well we'd love to, except we, uh, we don't know when we get a purchase order whether it's your part or not, because you guys don't identify yourselves on your POs. Like really? I didn't know that. So sometimes it just takes a conversation with them to find out why they think they can't report the changes to you and, and you know, iron out those differences. Unfortunately, it's almost a case-by-case -case basis. So it's a two-way street. You've got to tell them what you want, and then you have to give them a vehicle to, you know, get it into you and promise to get that uh, response back to them in a timely fashion. So that's my take. Uh, but 
one of the things that Steve mentioned is what's your confidence level that you're always notified? Well, it's not perfect. I, I don't know where it is. Uh, but we do certainly get notified of a lot of changes and we have a process in place to address them. The question is, of course, when you don't. And it happens we had one pretty significant supplier of ours recently that uh, we know they're well aware of the change control agreement. We know they, they know what they're not supposed to change and their sister company in China uh, decided to change, make a design change on a mold without notifying us. And uh, we found out when we had a failure and we did the failure investigation with them and that's when we discovered it. Well, you know, we issued a SCAR, we did raise it to a kappa because of the high level and this almost turned out to be a recall event. Luckily, uh, we were able to validate it and it didn't turn into that, but it, the repercussions, of course, are huge. They, on their side, their first statement of the SCAR is they fired the person that made the change. Well, uh, hopefully they did a little more training than that. They insisted and they showed us records that they were training all of their employees on our agreement and uh, that it was just this one random employee. I don't know that I could ever really buy that, but, uh, but no, the repercussions are significant and obviously much worse for us, if, but the potential for us was severe. Question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, this, I don't know who it applies to. I know it probably applies to Mike for sure, but when you're dealing with multi-divisions in your company and you find out that a lot of your divisions share similar or the same suppliers, what process do you have to make sure that a change notification being sent from a supplier to one division is being dispersed to anybody else that's potentially impacted? Have you developed any centralized process systems? What have you done? Yeah, actually, we have developed a centralized process. It just went live last year that ties the supplier to the receiving site and G Healthcare by part number. So when a change request comes in, it bounces up against the system and says who uses this and it goes to all parties and then it comes back to a central point and if all parties are in agreement that the change was okay or here's all the requirements, then you can plow ahead. Otherwise, it's prior to that, it, it was really a nightmare. I mean, it's a manual, you know, block and tackle, slug it out, never. No, it's not a homegrown system. Yeah, so okay, it's not a homegrown system. So follow up, if you don't mind, if asking what system you're using or uh, the platform's Oracle. Okay, uh, which conveniently matches up to our Oracle DRM platforms and EVM system and so on. So it makes it a little bit easier to translate data back and forth. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. From my standpoint, also we approve all of our parts um, for use, well, for purchase from the supplier and for use from that one supplier for each business unit inside using it. So when we get a change notification, we know what businesses use it and we give the communication, we make sure the communication is sent out to all those. Uh, and we use uh, Pilgrim software. Actually, I noticed in the thing that uh, was put on our desk, there is a picture from our system on there. I don't know if that's the real supplier, I hope not. But uh, uh, I know the supplier number is the real supplier number of ours. Uh, but we use that software and we, we do well, or we do, excuse me, qualify approved supplier, part, business unit site for a specific use. So we have that information. So that's all what, yes, right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, just to digress a minute, um, I had a question about when a supplier notifies you of a change, uh, it's always good business sense to respond, but is there a, a regulatory obligation to document that response back to the supplier? So um, you want to close all those loops, otherwise, by default, that you're accepting it, and you don't, you know, it goes back to what Kim said this morning. You didn't document it, it didn't happen. So you need to document those decisions um, that you agree or don't agree. Actually, what I advise my clients is, no change will have to take place until you respond and agree to it. And there shouldn't be a, a, a default yes if you don't hear from us. Um, but you know, you really need to close that loop because you're sitting with information that they may be implementing that change that could have a profound effect on your device. It may be a change in a manufacturing process or changing moving that may affect their verification and validation of, of your procedures. Yeah, it could be a change in materials. It could be a variety of things. I agree that you have to respond, but are we obligated to have objective evidence of that response? To the I would say without objective evidence, without it's your it's hearsay. It's you should definitely close that loop because you may know what's going on, 
a year from now or less, or if FDA shows up while you're on vacation and nobody has a history of it, you nobody will nobody will be able to respond to those issues should an issue occur. Same thing with Dr. Bid, you have a recall as an outcome of this. Well, who approved this? Where was it where it, it goes back to traceability? So while you know none of the requirements are prescriptive, these a lot of this is not rocket science, a lot of it's just common sense, and you really should should close those loops. So we heard